Support for the Growing Bolger podcast comes from the Florida Cancer Specialist. Florida Cancer Specialist urges everyone not to postpone recommended screenings such as mammograms, colonoscopies, or biopsies. Regular screenings save lives. More at flcancer.com slash get screened. Welcome to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Kathy Buccio coming to you from the Baptist Health South Florida studios. According to the American Cancer Society, lung cancer is by far the leading cause of cancer death. Each year, more people die of lung cancer than of colon, breast, and prostate cancers combined. However, new advances in oncology give patients more options for treatment, and the survival rate for lung cancer is increasing. And joining us today to discuss the treatment for lung cancer is Dr. Mark Delewski, Chief of Thoracic Surgical Oncology at Miami Cancer Institute. Welcome, doctor. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning, Kathy. Happy to be here. So let's get into our discussion about lung cancer. And this, is, this cancer is the second most common cancer in both men and women. So why is it so prevalent? Well, there's a number of risks out there for patients who um, are uh, diagnosed with lung cancer and one of the most common uh, risk factors excuse me <clears throat> one of the most common risk factors that everybody's aware of is smoking right but that's not the only risk factor and we do know that not every smoker comes down with lung cancer right um, so there's got to be other uh, factors that are involved and genetics is one of them we know that there is a genetic leak because we see multiple generations of family members who ultimately get cancer, whether they're smokers or not. Right. There's other risk factors like radon and asbestos exposure, occupational exposure, and we're not aware of all the risk factors. Mm -hmm. um, but we know, we know that smoking is prevalent. We know that we haven't had a huge impact in, in stopping the use of tobacco products in our population and the population of the world. And unfortunately, we're still faced with this um, increasing problem, which is lung cancer. Now, there are two <coughs> main types of lung cancer, doctor, and if you can speak to them, non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer. Uh, to me, they sound almost the same, but they're actually very different. Correct. And the reason why we break them up into small cell and non-small cell is because they're treated differently. Okay. Usually, small cell is a very aggressive type of cancer that when diagnosed, it's usually in the most advanced of stages in stage three and stage four. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, those patients can't be managed surgically. Um, and non-small cell cancer tends to be a little bit less uh, aggressive, tends to be diagnosed in an earlier stage where surgery has an impact. Okay. Um, and so that's mainly the reasons why we divide them into those categories is to try to define the treatment path for those individuals. Is the rate of success in treating each of these cancers different? It does differ. It okay. does differ. As I indicated, small cell tends to be a much uh, more aggressive right. treatment or aggressive cancer, and the treatment often involves a systemic type of therapy with palliative radiation. Whereas non-small cell, often probably about 60 to 70 percent of them, the patients ultimately require some sort of surgical intervention. Some require a combination of chemotherapy and radiation and surgery, and some are treated primarily systemically with chemotherapy. But it depends on really the stage in which the patient presents at. Is there one that's more common than the other that you see um, in patients? <clears throat> Non-small cell carcinoma tends to be more common. Okay. Um, we are seeing an increasing amount of adenocarcinoma, which is a type of non-small cell carcinoma, okay. over um, squamous cell carcinoma. For various reasons, we're seeing a change in the percentages of patients presenting with adenocarcinoma versus the squamous cell carcinoma. Now let's shift gears and talk for a little bit about what may put you at risk for lung cancer. And the first one everyone knows, and Dr. Deluski mentioned, is smoking. Now, tell us a little bit about what smoking does to the lungs, Dr. Deluski. Well, tobacco is a, a uh, product of a, a plant, a tobacco leaf. Unfortunately, the tobacco leaf and the tobacco that's put into um, cigarettes um, contains a great deal of, of elements that are considered what we call carcinogens right. or co-carcinogens. There's a number of different chemicals in tobacco that we know, if given to rats or other animals in high concentrations, can cause cancer. Right. And over a lifetime of using a tobacco product, those chemicals 
um, have a tendency to alter the genetic makeup or framework of cells, particularly in the lungs because that's where the tobacco exposure is the highest and it can alter um, the, the genetic makeup of the cells and it can grow into a cancer. It doesn't only affect the lungs though. The, the chemicals get in the system, uh, the blood system, and affects other uh, organs like the heart, the kidneys, the colon, and cancer can develop in almost any organ from the um, chemicals that get into the system through the use of tobacco. So lung cancer is not your only risk if you're a smoker. But I want to talk about a trend though, now with this discussion that we're talking about tobacco, which is we're seeing so much vaping. This new vaping among especially young people lately, they're, they say, oh, okay, I won't smoke, I'll just vape. But that comes with its own risk, correct? Yeah, many, many patients or smokers believe that using uh, a vapor, a vaporizer to um, settle their craving for nicotine is safer. Right. Um, in some respects, you can argue that it is safer. However, the problem with vaping is that there's very little regulation in the amount of nicotine that is put in these vaping products. And you can find that a single vial contains more nicotine than a cigarette. Than a, than in a pack of cigarettes. Oh my goodness. So someone who will vape a, a, a single vial, which is supposedly a single dose, can get the amount of nicotine um, in an entire pack of cigarettes in one session. And so your system becomes um, wow. more um, adjusted to the higher dose of nicotine and we know that nicotine is very addictive. Right. So that may even influence the amount of nicotine the patient is, or the person is taking, or if they continue to smoke and they stop vaping, they'll want more cigarettes and smoke more to, to fulfill that craving of nicotine. Uh, Dr. Jalinski, are you seeing that you need to educate more people on this or? Well, you know, unfortunately, Vaping is relatively new. I think the governmental agencies that regulate tobacco and now starting to regulate uh, vaping products and the companies that um, sell these products uh, have to begin to understand these risks to the community and the people that use them. And it, it certainly deserves more education. Um, we have had nearly 50 to 60 years of education around the use of tobacco and what the risk factors right. are. It's surprising to know that the incidence of uh, young individuals taking up cigarettes despite knowing all the potential risks that we have outlined for the past 40, 50 years, they still smoke. It's shocking. So I don't know if the, the government and the agencies that are responsible for edu educating the community is going to have a real impact because right. unfortunately nicotine is very addictive and we know how um, individuals respond to addictive uh, chemicals and often glamorized now we do have a caller we have caroline from miami caroline are you there uh, yes i am hi how are you good morning do you have a question for the doctor yes um my, my husband smoked for uh, for 30 years he started when he was a teenager and and he quit some time ago but but he has a a, a cough and I, i'm a little concerned about him Okay, and you want to ask the doctor if it's something that maybe he should be getting checked out? Yes, yes, exactly. Well, Caroline, it's a, a very interesting question. Um, many patients or people believe that if they stop smoking, that their risks of developing lung cancer go down to um, when they originally started smoking. Um, but that, we've discovered, is not true. Once you've smoked for more than 10 years, the risks are always there and they tend to digress very slowly. So if you stopped smoking many, many years ago, it's still recommended that the patient be evaluated with a screening CT scan. If a patient does have a cough um, and they have been a smoker, it's advisable that they get at least a CT scan to see if there's any signs that this could potentially be the problem with the cough. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you so much for calling into the show today. And I think that is such a big misconception, Dr. Deluski. I mean, I, for myself, I remember my grandfather was a smoker. They're again, also stopped like 30, 35 years and then developed lung cancer. And it was a shock because I think the first reaction was, but you don't even smoke anymore. Exactly. And, and it's a big, big misconception. Many patients believe that if they stop smoking, for uh, two or three decades that their risks are no longer there, but yeah. it's absolutely not true. And then as we talked about in the earlier session, there's other risks 
involved with lung cancer. If you have a family member, a previous family member right. that was diagnosed with lung cancer and you smoked in the past, your risks are substantially high, higher than someone who's a non-smoker. And then there's all these occupational exposures to right. chemicals, asbestos, radon, that people may not even be aware that they have been exposed to those chemicals and that increases their risk substantially as well. We do have some um, symptoms that I want to bring up and these are besides we, we heard our caller talk about a cough and, and this one often is I guess very common uh, as, yes. a, as a symptom? Okay. It, the one unfortunate thing about lung cancer is it doesn't cause any substantial symptoms until it's in, ad, in its in advanced stages. Okay. So a cough in a smoker is extremely common um, and it's very difficult to uh, diagnose someone with a developing cancer in its earliest stages mm -hmm. because it usually doesn't cause any symptoms for a very long time. And just to give you some statistics, out of all the people that present with lung cancer, 70% of patients present with advanced stage cancer, meaning wow. stage two, three, and four. Right. Um, so only rarely picked up at stage one. Exactly. So about 15% of patients, and then maybe up to 20% of patients, um, will be picked up in its earliest stages. And the most common way we pick these patients up for or with early stage cancer is they've had a scan for some other reason. Right. They're going in for eye surgery and they have a chest x-ray for preoperative clearance and they're found to have an abnormal nodule. Or they're astute enough to realize that they're at risk for lung cancer and they come into the screening program, they have a CT scan and we find an incidental nodule. That's where, as surgeons, we have a huge impact. Right. And if you can diagnose someone with early stage cancer, the curability of that cancer is much higher than when diagnosed at a later stage. Wow. So doctor, tell us about the importance of the screenings. I feel like we can't emphasize this enough. Well, we have known for many years, more than four decades, that um, we can identify patients at risk. Right. Um, and those are the patients that would benefit from a program like a CT screening program. And smoking, as we talked about in the earlier segment, is a primary risk factor. It's easy to identify someone who has been a smoker. The trouble we have is identifying patients with other risk factors, and right. we mentioned a couple of those. Asbestos is an occupational exposure. Many people that were working with asbestos may not even know that they were have been exposed to it. Radon is a, is a nuclear particle that's in the soil, and someone's house or may have been built over a radon prevalent area, and they may, may have been exposed as a, as a young boy or a, a child and may not even know it. Right. So those are the patients that are difficult to identify. Family uh, members who've prior had cancer, people who are non-smokers, we know 15 to 17 percent of patients who are diagnosed with lung cancer are non-smokers. So what caused their wow. cancer? So we do think that there's a genetic link to it, and it's very difficult to identify those patients are at, who are at risk. When you can identify those patients that are at risk, are they usually going to see their primary care physician to get these screenings, or does a primary care physician say, hey, I'm going to send you so that you can get additional testing done? So nowadays, we've had a number of studies that have demonstrated there's a benefit to lung screening, and most right. primary care physicians realize that um, screening their high-risk patient populations, those smokers, um, mm -hmm. uh, is beneficial. So most primary care or pulmonary medicine or internal medicine doctors are now identifying those patients at risk and referring them or at least having a conversation with the patient about getting a CT scan for screening purposes. Let's reaffirm again who needs to go get screened. What, what, what are those specifications that we're looking for? So the research that's been done on lung screening to use it in the most effective way, cost-effective way, and efficient way, they've identified potential risks of, of patients and patients who are offered lung screening should meet these criteria, right. which is basically a heavy history of smoking, okay? Um, either a current smoker that has smoked more than 10 years or a smoker who quit in less than right. the past 15 years. Now, there's an arbitrary age cutoff uh, for that. We, we, it's been cut off at 55 because the data has shown that you know, patients who've been a smoker, whether they started earlier in their years, at age 55, the risks start to increase. And then the cutoff for year 80 is because most smokers 
have died from other diseases before they're 80. Right. Um, if they make it to 80, then and they haven't gotten cancer at age 80, they're unlikely to, to get cancer. And if they do get cancer, they're likely to succumb to some other disease other than the cancer that they've de developed at age 80. So the data has demonstrated that the most cost-effective way of using lung screening is in this patient population. Right. Okay, so let's say lung cancer is detected, doctor. Now, what's the next? What's the next step in the diagnostic process? Is it straight to treatment or? So, you know, lung screening. It's interesting. If you diagnose someone with pulmonary a pulmonary nodule, we don't know whether it's cancer or not. Okay. Uh, based, just because the patient has an abnormal CT scan, so we have to have a you know a physician such as a pulmonologist or a thoracic surgeon or even radiologist evaluate the CT scan and see if there are certain criteria. Um, namely the risks that the patient has for lung cancer. And then there's characteristic findings on the CAT scan that would give you some idea that this is a cancer. And if it does look like it's a cancer, you should pursue it um, with further investigation, okay. either a biopsy, sometimes a PET scan, which is a different type of scan. That Can will, you explain what the PET scan well, is? Well, the PET scan is, a, is like a CT scan, but what the difference is, is they give the patient a sugar molecule with a nuclear particle. And we know that cancer, or any rapidly dividing cell in the body, will absorb glucose and okay. try to utilize it. So it concentrates this, this, this glucose molecule inside the cells of the cancer. And then when you scan the patient, you can see that it lights up in certain spots of the body. And that may tell you some information to clue you into whether this is a cancer or whether it's an inflammatory nodule. Wow, okay. Now, when it comes to treating cancer, there are a number of different options available. Chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, just to <coughs> name a few. So the majority of folks that come in are going to need some sort of multimodality therapy for their treatment of lung cancer. What that means is it may be a combination of chemotherapy, which is a medication they give through the vein, radiation, which is type of x-ray that they give to the tumor, mm -hmm. and then surgery. Now, we know that patients with early stage cancer, the best impact that the patient, or the best chance that the patient has for cure is to have it surgically removed, okay? Okay. Um, when you start to talk about using a combination of therapies, you're trying to impact the tumor to try to downstage the tumor in order to get rid of it or to be able to effectively downstage it so that we can surgically remove it. Absolutely. What an informative show today. Thank you, Dr. Jalewski, for joining us and for sharing your technique with us as well. Be sure to join us next time on the Health Channel. All health all the time on South Florida PBS. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at All Health TV, hashtag All Health TV, where you can get health tips from our experts and see what's coming up on the Health Channel. You can also visit our website, allhealthtv.com, where you can watch a live stream of the Health Channel and watch videos from previous episodes like this one. I'm Kathy Buccio. We'll see you next time.